Welcome back to Analyzing Mormonism. So we're taking a break this week and discussing the Gospel Topics essays. Uh, my sister is out of state, and I want her to be here when we give commentary on that. So, yeah, anyway, today I want to discuss the story of Charles Anthon. There are three historical documents I want to share. The first comes from the Church History, Volume A1, that gives the overall story of Charles Anthon as taught in the church curriculum. It was published, I believe, in 1838, although the date of this account is listed under September 1827. It wasn't written until much later, because they're just creating the they're just creating the church history from memory at this point. And if you're a member of the church, or if you were a member at any point, this, this story will probably be familiar to you. Um, so the second document is a letter from Charles Anthon himself. It was first published in a book called Mormonism Unveiled by E.D. Howe, and it was published in 1834, so just four years after the organization of the church. And the third document is also from Charles Anthon, and this one was published in a book titled Gleanings by the Way by Reverend John A. Clark, and this was published in 1842. Um, I also want to apologize really quick. Um, so I listened through these accounts again that I'm reading, and I talk really fast. <laughs> um, my family has always told me this. Um, I guess when you have 14 siblings, you kind of have to figure out how to get your word in edgewise. Um, my grandma hoped that my mission would cure me of my fast talking, but that didn't work. Um, so I apologize right now. Just, I talk really fast, so maybe that'll be good, maybe that'll be bad. <laughs> oh, actually, first, um, so I'm here on Joseph Smith Papers, and I there's a biography for Charles Anthon, and I just wanted to um, read what um, the church is saying about him. Um, so he was born the 17th of November, 1797. He died July 29th of 1867. He was a college professor lawyer born in New York City, son of George, Chris George Christian Anthon and Genevieve Judith, Attended Columbia College in 18, through 1811 to 1815 in New York City. He studied law, um, admitted to the bar in 1819. Um, he was an adjunct professor of Greek and Latin at Columbia College in 1820 and 1830. He was the rector of grammar school in 1830 to 1864. He was a full professor at Columbia College from 1830 to 1867. Um, he produced numerous classical textbooks for college students, and then he died in New York City. So that's what the church has to say on Joseph Smith Papers. Okay, so I'm just going to jump in and start reading from the document from the History of the Church in 1838, um, volume A1. It's on page 8, so if anyone wants to follow along. From the History of the Church, 1838 to 1856, volume A1, September 1827 to February 1828. The excitement, however, still continued, and rumor with her thousand tongues was all the time employed in circulating tales about my father's family and about myself. If I were to relate a thousandth part of them, it would fill up volumes. The persecution, however, became so intolerable that I was under the necessity of leaving Manchester and going with my wife to Susquehanna County in the state of Pennsylvania. While preparing to start, being very poor and the persecution so heavy upon us that there was no probability that we would ever be otherwise, in the midst of our afflictions, we found a friend in the gentleman by the name of Martin Harris, who came to us and gave us $50 to assist in our affliction. M. Harris was a resident of Palmyra Township, Wayne County, in the state of New York, and a farmer of respectability. By this timely aid, I was enabled to reach the place of destination in Pennsylvania, and immediately after my arrival there, I commenced copying the characters of the plates. I copied a considerable number of them, and by means of the Urim and Thummim, I translated some of them, which I did between the time I arrived at the house of my wife's father in the month of December and the February following. Sometime in this month of February, the aforementioned Mr. Martin Harris came to our place, got the characters which I had drawn off the plates, and started with them to the city of New York. For what took place relative to him and the characters, I refer to his own account of the circumstances as related them to me after his return, which was as follows. I went to the city of New York and presented the characters which had been translated, with the translation thereof, to Professor Charles Anthon, a gentleman celebrated for his literary attainments. Professor Anthon stated that the translation was correct, more so than any he had before seen translated from the Egyptian. I then showed him those which were not yet translated, and he said that they were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyriac, and Arabic, and he said that they were true characters. He gave me a certificate certifying to the people of Palmyra that they were true characters, and that the translation of such of them as had been translated was also correct. I took the certificate and put it into my pocket, and was just leaving the house when Mr. Anton called me back and asked me how the young man found out that there were gold plates in the place where he had found them. I answered that an angel of God had revealed it unto him. He then said to me, let me see that certificate. I accordingly took it out of my pocket and gave it to him, when he took it and tore it into pieces, saying that there was no such thing now as ministering of angels and that if I would bring the plates to him, he would translate them. I informed him that part of the plates were sealed, and that I was forbidden to bring them. He replied, I cannot read a sealed book. 
I left him and went to Dr. Mitchell, who sanctioned what Professor Anton had said respecting both the characters and the translation. Okay, so I actually lied. I'm going to read another document. Um, this is from the Palmyra Freeman, and it was published on August 11th, 1829. Golden Bible. The Palmyra Freeman says, The greatest piece of superstition that has ever come within our knowledge now occupies the attention of a few individuals of this quarter. It is generally known and spoken of as the Golden Bible. Its proselytes give the following account of it. In the fall of 1827, a person by the name of Joseph Smith of Manchester, Ontario County, reported that he had been visited in a dream by the Spirit of the Almighty and informed that in a certain hill in that town was deposited this Golden Bible, containing an ancient record of a divine nature and origin. After having been thrice thus visited, as he states, he proceeded to the spot and after penetrating Mother Earth a short distance, the Bible was found, together with a huge pair of spectacles. He had been directed, however, not to let any mortal being examine them, under no less penalty than instant death. They were therefore nicely wrapped up and excluded from the vulgar gaze of poor wicked mortals. It was said that the leaves of the Bible were plates of gold, about eight inches long, six wide and one eighth of an inch thick, on which were engraven characters or hieroglyphics. By placing the spectacles in a hat and looking into it, Smith could, he said so at least, interpret these characters. An account of this discovery was soon circulated. The subject was almost invariably treated as it should have been, with contempt. A few, however, believed the golden story, among whom was Martin Harris, an honest and industrious farmer in this town, Palmyra. So blindly enthusiastic was Harris that he took some of the characters interpreted by Smith and went in search of someone besides the interpreter who was learned enough to English them. But all to whom he applied, among the number was Professor Mitchell of New York, happened not to be professed of sufficient knowledge to give satisfaction. Harris returned and set Smith to work at interpreting the Bible. He has at length performed the task, and the work is soon to be put to press in Palmyra. Its language and doctrines are said to be far superior to those of the Book of Life. Okay, thank you for listening to that with me, going a little bit off script. Um, I had never read this um, article before, so that was really fun. And I just think it's interesting also that this newspaper points out that he was visited in a dream by the Almighty. And he's kind of getting the story mixed up with evidently uh, the Moroni story where he comes and sees him three times in the night. So like I can kind of see where the newspapers are coming from. It's just also interesting that it um, doesn't really talk about the first vision except that he was visited by the Almighty in a dream. So there's that. So while I was reading that newspaper, I also found that he did write about this in 1832. This just isn't a very full account. So I'm going to just read it anyway because I want all of the evidence, all of the documents. So he, this is in 1832 when he, uh, Joseph, uh, makes his first attempt at writing the history of the church. On the 22nd day of September of this same year, meaning 1827, I obtained the plates, and in the December following we moved to Susquehanna by the assistance of a man by the name of Martin Harris, who became convinced of the vision and gave me fifty dollars to bear my expenses. And because of his faith in this righteous deed, the Lord appeared unto him in a vision and showed unto him his marvelous work which he was about to do. And he immediately came to Susquehanna and said the Lord had shown unto him that he must go to New York City with some of the characters. So we proceeded to copy some of them, and he took his journey to the eastern cities and to the learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And the learned said, I cannot. But if he would bring the plates, they would read it. But the Lord had forbade it and returned it to me and gave it them to me to translate. And I said, I cannot, for I am not learned. But the Lord had prepared spectacles for to read the book thereof. I commenced translating the characters, and thus the prophecy of Isaiah was fulfilled, which is written in the 29th chapter concerning the book. I'm going to put a plug in for a website called fullerconsideration.com, and if you type in the Anthem transcript, it gives you all the times in church history where they talked about or published um, anything to do with Charles Anthem or this prophecy in Isaiah, and it's really interesting to look at. Okay, so now moving on to the second document, which is now like the fourth document, I guess. I don't even know. Um, anyway, but this one, as I said before, comes from the book Mormonism Unveiled by E.D. Howe. And this is a letter written to E.D. Howe that he published in that book in 1834. New York, February 17th, 1834. Dear Sir, I received this morning your favor of the ninth instant and lose no time in making a reply. The whole story about my having pronounced the Mormonite inscription to be reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics is perfectly false. Some years ago, a plain and apparently simple-hearted farmer called upon me with a note from Dr. Mitchell of our city, now deceased, requesting me to decipher, if possible, a paper which the farmer would hand me and which Dr. M. confessed he had been unable to understand. 
Upon examining the paper in question, I soon came to the conclusion that it was all a trick, perhaps a hoax. When I asked the person who brought it how he obtained the writing, he gave me, as far as I can now recollect, the following account. A gold book consisting of a number of gold plates, fastened together in the shape of a book by wires of the same metal, had been dug up in the northern part of the state of New York, and along with the book, an enormous pair of gold spectacles. These spectacles were so large that, if a person attempted to look through them, his two eyes would have been turned towards one of the glasses merely, the spectacles in question being altogether too large for the breadth of the human face. Whoever examined the plates through the spectacles was enabled not only to read them, but fully to understand their meaning. All this knowledge, however, was confined at that time to a young man, who had the trunk containing the book and spectacles in his sole possession. This young man was placed behind a curtain, in the garret of a farmhouse, and being thus concealed from view, put on the spectacles occasionally, or rather, looked through one of the glasses, deciphered the characters in the book, and, having committed some of them to paper, handed copies from behind the curtain to those who stood on the outside. Not a word, however, was said about the plates having been deciphered by the gift of God. Everything in this way was affected by the large pair of spectacles. The farmer added that he had been requested to contribute a sum of money towards the publication of the Golden Book, the contents of which would, as he had been assured, produce an entire change in the world and save it from ruin. So urgent had been these solicitations that he intended selling his farm and handing over the amount received to those who wished to publish the plates. As a last precautionary step, however, he had resolved to come to New York and obtain the opinion of the learned about the meaning of the paper which he had brought with him, and which had been given him as a part of the contents of the book, although no translation had been furnished at the time by the young man with the spectacles. On hearing this odd story, I changed my opinion about the paper, and, instead of viewing it any longer as a hoax upon the learned, I began to regard it as part of a scheme to cheat the farmer of his money, and I communicated my suspicions to him, warning him to beware of rogues. He requested an opinion from me in writing, which of course I declined giving, and he then took his leave, carrying the paper with him. This paper was in fact a singular scrawl. It consisted of all kinds of crooked characters, disposed in columns, and had evidently been prepared by some person who had before him at the time a book containing various alphabets. Greek and Hebrew letters, crosses and flourishes, Roman letters inverted or placed sideways were arranged in perpendicular columns, and the whole ended in a rude delineation of a circle divided into various compartments decked with various strange marks and evidently copied after the Mexican calendar given by a Humboldt, but copied in such a way as to not betray the source whence it was derived. I am thus particular as to the contents of the paper, inasmuch as I frequently converse with my friends on the subject since the Mormon excitement began, and well remember that the paper contained anything else but Egyptian hieroglyphics. Some time after, the same farmer paid me a second visit. He brought with him the golden book in print and offered it to me for sale. I declined purchasing. He then asked permission to leave the book with me for examination. I declined receiving it, although his manner was strangely urgent. I adverted once more to the roguery which had been, in my opinion, practiced upon him, and asked him what had become of the gold plates. He informed me that they were in a trunk with a large pair of spectacles. I advised him to go to a magistrate and have the trunk examined. He said the curse of God would come upon him should he do this. On my pressing him, however, to pursue the course which I had recommended, he told me that he would open the trunk if I would take the curse of God upon myself. I replied that I would do so with the greatest willingness and would incur every risk of that nature, provided I could only extricate him from the grasp of rogues. He then left me. I have thus given you a full statement of all that I know respecting the origin of Mormonism, and must beg you, as a personal favor, to publish this letter immediately, should you find my name mentioned again by those wretched fanatics. Yours respectfully, Charles Anthon. So Charles Anthon here is directly contradicting the story that Martin Harris gave to Joseph Smith in... I guess it was supposed to be 1827, um, but in the 1832 account and in the 1838 account. This is just directly contradictory. Charles says, I didn't do that. I didn't give him a certificate. I told him it was a hoax. I told him it was a scam. This is not what happened. And in fact, I warned him against selling his farm. One thing that I did want to point out is that even though Charles Anthon speaks out against this, the church still today tells the original story by Martin Harris. In the Saints book, volume one, in chapter 5, it gives the same story again that Martin Harris gave, and this was published in 2018. So just, what, four or five years later, the church is still holding that story. Okay, so this last document um, is also from Charles Anthony, and it was published, like I said, in 1842 by a reverend named John A. Clark. New York, April 3rd, 1841. Reverend and dear sir, I have often heard that the Mormons claimed me for an auxiliary, but... As no one, until the present time, has ever requested from me a statement in writing, I have not deemed it worthwhile to say anything publicly on the subject. 
What I do know of the sect relates to some of their early movements, and as the facts may amuse you, while they will furnish a satisfactory answer to the charge my being a Mormon proselyte, I proceed to lay them before you in detail. Many years ago, the precise date I do not now recollect, a plain-looking countryman called upon me with a letter from Dr. Samuel L. Mitchell requesting me to examine and give my opinion upon a certain paper marked with various characters which the doctor confessed he could not decipher and which the bearer of the note was very anxious to have explained. A very brief examination of the paper convinced me that it was a mere hoax, and a very clumsy one, too. The characters were arranged in columns like the Chinese mode of writing, and presented the most singular medley I had ever beheld. Greek, Hebrew, and all sorts of letters, more or less distorted, either through the unskillfulness or from actual design, were intermingled with sundry delineations of half-moons, stars, and other natural objects, and the whole ended in a rude representation of the Mexican zodiac. The conclusion was irresistible, that some cunning fellow had prepared the paper in question, for the purpose of imposing upon the countryman who brought it, and I told the man so without any hesitation. He then proceeded to give me history of the whole affair, which convinced me that he had fallen into the hands of some sharper, while it left me in great astonishment at his own simplicity. The countryman told me that a gold book had been recently dug up in the western or northern part, I forget which, of our state, and described this book as consisting of many gold plates, like leaves, secured by a gold wire, passing through the edge of each, just as the leaves of a book are sewed together, and presented in this way the appearance of a volume. Each plate, according to him, was inscribed with unknown characters, and the paper which he handed me, a transcript of one of these pages, on my asking him by whom the copy was made, he gravely stated that along with the golden book, there had been dug up a very large pair of spectacles, so large, in fact, that if a man were to hold them in front of his face, his two eyes would merely look through one of the glasses, and the remaining part of the spectacles would project a considerable distance sideways. These spectacles possessed, it seems, very valuable property of enabling anyone who looked through them, or rather, through one of the lenses, not only to decipher the characters on the plates, but also to comprehend their exact meaning and to be able to translate them. My informant assured me that this curious property of the spectacles had been actually tested and found to be true. A young man, it seems, had been placed in the garret of a farmhouse with a curtain before him, and having fastened the spectacles to his head, had read several pages in the golden book, and communicated their contents in writing to certain persons stationed on the outside of the curtain. He had also copied off one page of the book in the original character, which he had in the like manner handed over to those who were separated from him by the curtain, and this copy was the paper which the countryman had brought with him. As the golden book was said to contain very great truths and most important revelations of a religious nature, a strong desire had been expressed by several persons in the countryman's neighborhood, to have the whole work translated and published. A proposition had accordingly been made to my informant to sell his farm and apply the proceeds to the printing of the golden book, and the golden plates were to be left with him as a security until it should be reimbursed for the sale of the work. To convince him more clearly that there was no risk whatsoever in the matter, and that the work was actually what it claimed to be, he was told to take the paper, which purported to be a copy of one of the pages of the book, to the city of New York, and submit it to the learned in that quarter, who would soon dispel all of his doubts and satisfy him as to the perfect safety of the investment. As Dr. Mitchell was our Magnus Apollo in those days, the man called first upon him. But the doctor, evidently suspecting some trick, declined giving any opinion about the matter, and sent the countryman down to the college to see, in all probability, what the learned pundits in that place would make of the affair. On my telling the bearer of the paper that an attempt had been made to impose on him and defraud him of his property, he requested me to give him my opinion in writing about the paper, which he had shown to me. I did so without any hesitation, partly for the man's sake and partly to let the individual behind the curtain see that his trick was discovered. The import of what I wrote was, as far as I can now recollect, simply this, that the marks in the paper appeared to be merely an imitation of various alphabetical characters and had, in my opinion, no meaning at all connected with them. The countryman then took his leave, with many thanks, and with the express declaration that he would in no shape part with his farm or embark in the speculation of printing the golden book. The matter rested here for a considerable time until one day, when I had ceased entirely to think of the countryman and his paper, the same individual, to my great surprise, paid me a second visit. He now brought with him a duodecimo volume, which he said was a translation into English of the Golden Bible. He also stated that notwithstanding his original determination not to sell his farm, he had been induced eventually to do so, and applied the money to the publication of the book, and had received the golden plates as a security for repayment. He begged my acceptance of the volume, assuring me that it would be found extremely interesting, and that it was already making a great noise in the upper part of the state. Suspecting now that some serious trick was on foot, and that my plain-looking visitor might be in fact a very cunning fellow, I declined his present, and merely contented myself with a slight examination of the volume while he stood by. The more I declined receiving it, however, the more urgent the man became in offering the book, until at last I told him plainly that if he left the volume, as he said he intended to do so, I should most assuredly throw it after him as he departed. 
I then asked how he could be so foolish as to sell his farm and engage in this affair, and requested him to tell me if the plates were really of gold. In answer to this latter inquiry, he said that he had never seen the plates themselves, which were carefully locked up in a trunk, but that he had the trunk in his possession. I advised him by all means to open the trunk and examine the contents, and if the plates proved to be of gold, which I did not believe at all, to sell them immediately. His reply was that if he opened the trunk, the curse of heaven would descend upon him and his children. However, added he, I will agree to open it, provided that you will take the curse of heaven upon yourself for having advised me to the step. I told him I was perfectly willing to do so, and begged he would hasten home and examine the trunk, for he would find he had been cheated. He promised to do as I recommended, and left me, taking his book with him. I have never seen him since. Such is a plain statement of all that I know respecting the Mormons. My impression now is that the plain-looking countryman was none other than the prophet Smith himself, who assumed an appearance of great simplicity in order to entrap me, if possible, into some recommendation of his book. That the prophet aided me by his inspiration in interpreting the volume is only one of the many amusing falsehoods which the Mormonites utter relative to my participation in their doctrines. Of these doctrines I know nothing whatever, nor have I ever heard a single discourse from any one of their preachers, although I have often felt a strong curiosity to become an auditor, since my friends tell me that they frequently name me in their sermons, and even go so far as to say that I am alluded to in the prophecies of scripture. If what I have here written shall prove of any service in opening the eyes of some of their deluded followers to the real designs of those who profess to be the apostles of Mormonism, it will afford me a satisfaction equaled, I have no doubt, only to that which you yourself will feel in the subject. I remain very respectfully and truly your friend, Charles Anthon. Don't you love those stories? I just love that. And like, if you leave this book with me, I'm going to throw it at you. And also like, of course, yeah, I'll take the curse upon me. Just open the box and make sure you're not getting cheated. So I love how consistent Charles Anthon seems to be in both of these accounts. He visits him twice. He gives the same reasoning, gives the same answer. Like, it's just very consistent. The only thing or the biggest thing that's different about these two accounts is that he doesn't seem to know who he's talking to. He assumes that it's Joseph Smith. He assumes that it's the prophet. Um, which I, I guess if he didn't know Martin Harris, there's no reason why he would have remembered uh, who he was. But also, um, as it points out in the book Saints, um, in chapter five, it says that Charles Anthon was 15 years younger than Martin Harris. And so he might have just seen him as an old farmer. And there's two Joseph Smiths, so he could have been like getting them confused. Another thing that I wanted to point out was that in July of 1799, so like 20 years before this, 30 years before this, a stone was found in the city of Rosetta by French soldiers during Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. So the Rosetta stone had just been discovered, and this kind of study, this learning Egyptian characters, wasn't even a thing yet. The church points out that yes, Charles Anthony was a learned man, but he only studied Greek and Latin, so I'm not sure why Martin Harris would have gone to him to see if the characters on the place were truly some kind of reformed Egyptian. I mean, I totally get why Martin wanted a second opinion before selling his farm and financing the whole ordeal, it just doesn't seem like the best thing for him to have done. In the original story, Charles Anthon gives him a certificate that authenticates that the characters are true Egyptian characters, when in reality, Charles Anthon didn't even have the credentials to do that. Pretty much no one did at the time. So of all these accounts that I've read, there's a theme that Charles Anthon is fulfilling prophecy given in Isaiah 29. And I want to read that prophecy because I think it means something different than what we think it does. In Isaiah 29, 9, 13, it says, Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of a deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men delivered to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near unto me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but I have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men. So putting Isaiah into context, it doesn't seem like he's talking about some future event where he's going to read a book that is sealed. It sounds like he's saying that people are regarding the word of God as much as they would regard a book that is sealed. They just can't get at it. It seems like mankind is ignoring the words of God and they won't do any good until, they won't be unsealed until you read and follow them. So the Bible also talks about other sealed books that aren't the Book of Mormon. Um, in Daniel 12 and Revelations, it talks about other different sealed books, which is interesting. Okay, so we've got Joseph Smith and Martin Harris saying that 
Charles Anthon did authenticate the characters. We have the Palmyra Freeman in 1829 saying that no one was learned enough to give this kind of certificate. And then we have Charles Anthon coming out twice saying that this story did not happen the way that the church has been saying that it happened. Now, I'm not expecting the church to change anything. This is just, it just feels disingenuous for the church to keep pushing this story when the leading character in the story says that this didn't actually happen the way that the church says it has happened. Um, these things fascinate me. I love church history. It's just so interesting and it's just funny. Like, Charles Anthon is a funny guy. This, anyway. <laughs> okay, well, that's all I've got for this episode. Thank you for joining me. I hope you have a fantastic day.